So welcome everybody. Welcome to our session. Uh, you're here to uh, build an army of camels, I guess. So uh, let's introduce ourselves a little bit. Do you want to bring up the slides, Rachel? Yes. Cool. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Okay. Awesome. Sure. So that's us. So can you go to the next slide? Thank you. All right, so just a little bit about us too, we. Um, so I am Christina Lin and I am a portfolio architect. Uh, I, I did a bunch of integration project before, but now I'm moving more towards a, a whole stack portfolio architect where I'm looking from top to bottom, from your GUI interface to your uh, platform that's serving the entire stack. So I'm uh, more, uh, more of a whole stack architect, architect right now, but I do have a YouTube video that has a bunch of camel content in there. So you're welcome to uh, visit my YouTube channel and follow my D zone. So I'd write a, a bunch of articles too about camels and things inter that interest me. Um, so, and um, so as has been in the industry for so long, I do feel like the, the technology should be easy to consume. So therefore we try to make uh, technology easy and simple for you to learn, and that's what we are going. That's what we're going to do today. And I'm handing over to Rachel. Thanks so much, Christina. So um, hi, everybody. My name is Rachel Jordan, and I'm a software engineer for Red Hat. Uh, I work particularly for a Diffuse team within the middleware and integration kind of division. I've been at Red Hat for I think it's six years now. And you can, of course, follow me on Twitter if you have any questions on this presentation. Um, and with that, I'll jump right into it. So today I'll be talking a little bit about Apache Camel and cloud native uh, integration frameworks that you can use to make your life just a little bit easier. So most of us here are familiar with Apache Camel already. Uh, it's known for being small, but incredibly powerful and, more importantly, uh, quite easy to use. Uh, we know that there are a lot of benefits to using an integration framework like Campbell, some of them listed here. Um, and uh, I mean, a couple of those, I guess I, I, I should probably iterate a little bit over, but um, but it's incredible really to be able to, to use something that uh, is based on kind of tried and tested uh, patterns that people have done research on for years and be able to rely on that and easily make integrations using frameworks like that. Um, it makes it a lot easier to maintain your code, makes it a lot easier to, to well, to write your code um, and to test everything. Uh, it also keeps it quite decoupled as well. So um, yeah, and you of course can get faster to market. Uh, but it's interesting because when uh, when popular apps like Zapier and if this and that came out, uh, I thought, man, we're, we're really lucky as developers because we could do a lot of those things with Camel for free. Uh, we really stand on the shoulders of giants and, and all of the work that they've done over years and, and build things using these kind of tried and, and tested patterns uh, that enterprises have been using for years. Um, and yeah, and, and with that, we have uh, several hundred connectors and camel components at our disposal and a whole lot of leverage. So where does that leave us? Well, when you look at the big picture, in particular, uh, the development process, well, it's definitely a lot to deal with. Uh, there's so much to learn, there's so much to do, and there's a lot of kind of admin, I guess, is, is the better word for, for using it, that goes into it. Uh, the majority of the time is, is spent kind of handling dependencies and, you know, debugging and things like that, but dealing with like uh, version conflicts and, and that kind of thing, and preparing for deployments as well to OpenShift and to Kubernetes. Um, when you want to uh, publish an application onto Kubernetes, you first need to build the app. Um, you need to put it in a container, and you got to push the image to Kubernetes. Uh, so if you need to do any kind of debugging or make changes, then you kind of have to start all over again and uh, and build it again. For me, I think the worst part of that is the wait. It's it's well, it's definitely uh, time consuming, uh, and it's it breaks the flow kind of of your, your thought process and, and all of that. And 
as somebody personally that has struggles with attention issues, I definitely don't appreciate that. Uh, so all of that can get quite, you know, can get quite uh, daunting and frustrating. So this is kind of um, an oversimplified view, I guess, of what the processes might look like at the moment. Uh, you have your code, and as I said, you, you write your integration, you, you, um, you build the app, and then you might want to kind of put it into a container and, um, and then build the image for, uh, to then deploy into Kubernetes. But kind of when you see it on paper, it's, it's not so bad, I guess. It's not terrible, but, you know, it could be better. Um, but if you also start to consider kind of the in-between things that I mentioned, like the dependency handling and then the version conflicts, debugging, all of that, it, it, things as small as like you want to make changes to your code, that's where things start to really um, keep you honest, I guess. It's, it's really the in-between the lines where you see the majority of the time is, uh, is spent and a lot of the frustrations lie, I think. So if you think just for a moment, you know, we could kind of like get whatever we wish for. I think it would be really awesome if we can skip one of those steps altogether. Like we solve a lot of problems by just skipping steps <laughs> sometimes. Um, and in this particular case, um, I think it would be even nicer if we could have something specifically made for the cloud. Uh, maybe something serverless friendly that is also smart enough to do a lot of those repetitive things uh, and that, that are considered to be time consuming tasks for us. It's not like we're really skipping it. It's more like we just don't have to do it because something's doing it for us. Um, I think that would be pretty perfect of a scenario if you ask me. Um, and also uh, for our non-CAMEL users, I think it would be nice if we if we could have kind of um, a lower barrier to entry, I guess. CAMEL has a quite straightforward uh, DSL. It's quite easy to understand, but uh, yeah, it'd be nice if you kind of, uh, if it'd be easier just to pick up, you know, we always want to lower the barrier uh, to entry. So if we can skip that part that involves the admin and only worry about the code and, uh, and the ability to kind of make changes accordingly, then I think it would save us a lot of headache. And luckily for us, there is a solution to that. Uh, we're still standing on the shoulders of giants. And um, and the people that kind of have dealt with this problem enough and I guess had the same kind of wishes that I had got together and said, hey, you know what? We have something really good that we're working with here. Um, so let's not reinvent the wheel uh, because Camel solves a lot of kind of common problems for integration developers. Uh, these inter enterprise um, integration patterns, uh, they've they were pretty much created with the very purpose of, you know, of making a lot of those repetitive tasks within integration uh, much easier and less redundant. Um, the, the Camel DSL, like I said, is, is quite simple and you have already a wide variety of uh, mature components at your disposal and that facilitate those, those patterns that, are, um, that we rely on. So the question is, how can we kind of modernize it for these architectural trends and changes? Um, how do we help adapt this awesome project and make it evolve uh, to accommodate these requirements, particularly uh, to work with serverless and microservice architectures and all kind of the hot stuff um, that everybody's talking about without really uprooting the entire Camel community? And so, they created a sub project of Camel called Camel K. And that gives you the same benefits of Camel. Uh, you have access to the same uh, components, 300 more components. Um, and the difference is that it's, it's built with these cloud native technologies in mind. And you have concepts like Quarkus and the operator pattern already baked in. So that allows it to be fast and to speak the language of Kubernetes. So in the past, operators kind of were, um, were people, right? They, um, they used to kind of take care of the legacy environments, make sure everything was in place and uh, you know, dependencies were handled, everything was, was okay for the application to run basically. Um, they're 
just commonly used, I guess, to install and in, in this case to, um, to configure applications or platforms on, on OpenShift and Kubernetes, because now we live in a more modern world where, you know, we're not using the human operators as much anymore, but, um, but yeah. So we have the same kind of thing in Camel K. And um, these operators are, they're quite intelligent and um, they know what you, what you want to run. So uh, they can understand both the Camel DSL and Kubernetes as well. So just this is kind of just to give you an overview, like a, a general idea of all the things that the Camel K operator does behind the scenes and like how much time it saves you. And, um, and actually the main responsibility of the Camel K operator is to, to look for Camel K integrations uh, that, that are deployed with Camel and to be like, okay, hey, let's build and deploy this now as a Kubernetes application. So all of that, all of that is possible because of, because of the operator SDK. So it performs all of these operate up, up <laughs> It performs all of these operations on the Kubernetes resources needed for running the Camel DSL script. So in other words, I guess you can say it just, it scans the application and, um, and creates the resources that your application needs within the cluster. So with Camel K, you eliminate probably one of the most annoying parts of the process, at least for me, by letting, uh, by letting developers to quickly and immediately make changes uh, to their apps on Kubernetes. And that's possible because you're streaming the code to uh, using the Camel K operator. Um, and also another really solid kind of reason to use it is because it supports a, a wide range of languages. So, you know, do you have like Java, do you have Groovy, JavaScript, XML, YAML, etc. cetera. Um, and you don't even need really a heavyweight framework or anything like that. Like you don't need Spring Boot or anything like that. You could just, you know, using plain Java main class, like you can, you can easily get started. You don't need to have um, anything particularly special. But of course, having said that, you could also use something like Orcus if you're familiar with it, uh, that'll just make your application super duper fast and you'll have like a fast boot up uh, time as well um, and go completely like the serverless route. Uh, but but you really don't need to. And I think that's part of what makes it quite special. Another kind of annoying task that it uh, that I think Camel K really helps with is configuring dependencies. Uh, so with handling dependencies, you obviously, you get a lot of redundancy, you get a lot of wasted resources um, and version conflicts. It's, it can get really messy. Uh, so it, it picks up the dependencies that are required, um, as I said before, to run your application and, um, and it locates pretty much automatically associated libraries with it. Uh, but the cool thing is that you can also, um, you also have the option to load additional kind of like specific libraries or anything else that you might need. It's also uh, smart enough to discover any resources required to run your application. And uh, I'm gonna be a bit more specific about that. So, so let's say that you have, uh, let's say you have an API, right? Like, like a normal REST API, you have uh, it has certain endpoints and you expose an HTTP endpoint within the app. Well, Camel K will totally notice that and it'll create a related service for it, that endpoint. Um, so it'll actually create a route for you on the platform. That's all, like, that's awesome. Um, it also configures cron jobs uh, based on whatever behavior you've defined in the code. Uh, it does lots of things like it handles configurations, um, it converts property files into Kubernetes resources. Uh, and so if you were to were to remove uh, a resource or something like that from your app, then Camel K will delete it for you automatically. So it's just a lot less work, I guess. So overall, it's, uh, it's quite small, but super powerful. And let's not forget that, of course, the core is based on Camel, which itself is awesome. And, um, and yeah, can't think of enough reasons um, to use Camel K.
I mean, I can't think of enough reasons not to <laughs> not use camel cake. Um, so you often hear about camel cake uh, within the context of K-Native, and there is definitely a reason for that, and that's because it works super well with it. So serverless is popular for a lot of reasons, and I won't kind of get into why you should or should not go serverless, but, um, but it, a lot of it comes down to nobody wants to predict their, uh, their workload anymore, right? So people want to, uh, to be able to scale uh, you know, just with like a couple of commands or clicks of a button, and Knative allows you to do that. So, so you know, uh, you have with time saved, you're able to get to market faster that way as well. And it's one of the many kind of benefits that serverless gives you. But Knative is not 100% a, a serverless platform, and there really is no plan for that to happen. So, Camel K really, it, it's kind of it. It gives you another piece of the puzzle, of the serverless puzzle, if you will. And um, and it provides a build area for you and the Knative serving area, Knative eventing area as well. Um, again, I won't get too much into detail of each of those things, but I just want you to realize that it's totally possible for you to go serverless with CamelK because it's made for that. Um, and it's kind of it's an, a seamless transition. So if it's something that you've been thinking about, you've been wanting to try out, I think this is definitely um, a way to do a way to do that. And it's also possible to run uh, an existing Camel K integration as a Knative server serverless service. Uh, so if it's something that you want to change your mind about later on or down the road that you want to try, you could always do that as well. But of course, it's not just serverless. Uh, you'll see many many, many examples of Camel K within the context of serverless because it's quite popular. And that's cool and everything, but I just want to reiterate that it's not 100% necessary and you can use it um, on its own, even just a plain Java app. So sometimes it's easy to get overwhelmed with all like the cool technologies and everything like that, but just because it, they work well together does not mean it's necessary, so don't get intimidated. So. Uh, Straightforward, just to describe how you install Camel K, just as simple as it is to uh, to use it. Uh, so you do need to have access to a cluster, and uh, and then you would just install a very small Camel binary, and um, and you're done pretty much. And if you have um, the if you have the OpenShift console, then you can even use operator install it. So just through the UI, and you're good to go. And I just wanted to quickly show that how incredibly simple it is to get set up and to and to use uh, and to use Camel K. So you just create your integration file, and and again, it's quite uh, just a couple of, with just a couple of lines of code. You're you're ready to go and give it like a, an honest um, an honest attempt, um, and then you would just run it with Camel Run, and um, and that's it. You're done. Three steps and you can pretty much go uh, the serverless route if you want to as well. Um, obviously, you would need to have a couple other things set up if you were to go to truly uh, serverless, but yeah. I also wanted to mention that the team have been working on something incredible called Camlet um, or Camel Route Snippets um, for Camel K. And, um, and what the goal with Camelot uh, is, is just to hide lower level details about how the connections are implemented. So they usually work in pairs. Uh, so you have your source and you have your sync, where the source allows you to consume uh, the data uh, from an external system. And then you have the sync, which lets you send data to an external system. It's not one-to-one -one exactly like a Camel component because they're templates, but because they're templates, uh, it gives you a lot more flexibility and they can get way more complex than a, than a Camel route. But uh, but it's incredible because you can you have you can have like a really complex uh, system and using something like Camelot, you can just um, pretty much anybody will be able to use the system um, because you're using an abstracted layer that is hiding away those low-level details. And you can kind of think of them just as generic connectors, because at the end of the day, they're, they're just uh, resources uh, that can be installed on any Kubernetes cluster. Okay, 
So now that you know um, a little bit about Camp K, I thought I would leave you with some closing remarks on kind of my own perspective on Camel K and how it's made my life easier as a developer. So one of my favorite things about Camel is that you have options and that includes uh, choosing the language. Uh, so for instance, in my case, there had been, it had been a while since I had actually used Java and I wanted to, uh, to, to, uh, to work a bit with Camel and with Camel K. And I'd been using a lot of JavaScript recently, so I was able to kind of pick it up and, um, and going through that route was awesome as well. Uh, but more importantly, I just would not use a tool or a framework where if I had to wait a really long time between builds, like if I, if I needed to make some change that, that would then um, deter me from even wanting to debug it, then I probably wouldn't use it. And to me, I hear people say that Camel K brings back developer joy. And I truly, truly feel that when I've used it. So I hope that when you give it a try, that is, it'll do the same for you. OK, so it's demo time. <laughs> Uh, this is going to be a super quick one, uh, but the goal here is that we're going to send a message from Telegram to a Kafka topic. Uh, so what I've done is I've set up a Telegram bot um, and it's called Sightings Bot. So what I want is for, for anybody to be able to report a camel sighting. So if you see a camel, you open your Telegram app, you say, hey, oh my God, it's a camel, blah, blah, blah. And then I can see this, I received this message in Kafka. So let me see. OK, so first thing I want to show is that I've gone with the, the OpenShift route here. So I already have my, my cluster. I'm using StreamC, which makes it super easy to work with Kafka. And I also have my Kafka, uh, the producer, and the, um, and the consumer as well. So, so we come here to the code. And yes, I know you can see my auth token, but that's OK. I'm going to delete it. Um, we'll start here first. So the first thing is that we are defining the, uh, the source. So in this case, the source is the Telegram bot. And um, we're setting the body. And we are, um, we are just simply formatting the string and saying, hey, we want this to show that it's coming from Telegram. We are marshalling the, the JSON, even though uh, since we're working with Kafka, it's not really necessary, but I've done it anyway. So, um, and then we log the body here. And in the next step, then we're saying, okay, next thing we want is uh, to send it to this Kafka topic. You define your topic here and your broker URL there, set the body. And then what we want is for this message to be to be returned, which is thank you for re reporting your camel sighting. Have a nice day. And finally, this is will be output to another sync, which is the Telegram bots. And again, your authorization token there. So this is the actual uh, code that I'm running. So I have purposely put a typo there so you can see. And how we will have how we will run this is we will simply do a camel run. And in my case, I'll do a dash dash dev just because I want, would like to have the, the dev flag. Okay. So when you come here to the, to the OpenShift uh, developer console to the topology view, here we can see Telegram sightings uh, has been deployed, it's running. So next thing is that we should be able to, if I have not, should be able to, and we see that we've done this before, but in my house, and we should see the message returned back. Thank you for reporting your Kamsudil sighting. Have a nice day. And that's the, the typo that I purposely put in there. You can also see here that it has been uh, reported as well. So if I were to come back to the code, which I'm just going to quickly do, and change and fix the typo don't add another typo okay then you will see that it says here telegrams well it's already gone but it's a telegram uh sightings has been updated and it quickly updates your code for you so should be fixed now 
Thank you for reporting your camel sighting. Perfect. And that's pretty much it. So you can see how kind of quickly uh, it has updated the application and, and we're able to kind of continue with our, our flow from there. All right, uh, that pretty much concludes the, the demo in my case. Um, so I can hand over now to Christina. Um, awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay, cool. So thank you, Rachel, for uh, taking us through how to create Camel, how, how wonderful Camel K is. Now let's get to the part where um, we're going to manage them, right? So. Uh, if you want to manage a fleet of camels, you have to think about a lifetime or what is a lifetime for camel is. Well, you have the baby part where you're kind of growing the camel, you're making it strong, you're making it to work. And then you have to take that camel. Um, once it's ready to run, when it's ready to go, you need to start getting it to work, putting it to the works, workplace. And before it goes to the workplace, you need to, you need to make sure this camel actually can, is going to do the same thing as it's supposed to do. It's not going to go off and run into a different direction when you try to tell it to go to the other direction, right? So there's other things you need to do. You might want to uh, make sure like testing it out a little bit. And then once you know that like, this camel is very well defined and well done, you want to actually place them into their workspace. And this is where they're going to make the most use useful right and and then how to get them from one point to the other is important so therefore we want to introduce you to how do we get from a camel baby into that works workplace and once you get that all the camel working for you how you know how, how do you make sure all the camel works as expected if there's nothing wrong with camels and stuff like that right so this is kind of like a lifetime of camel and this and in this uh in this part of the sessions i'm gonna go through some of the very useful toolings that i personally prefer Remember, this is just me. There's other things that could be useful for you, but I'm just saying for me, I think they're super useful. So if you are building a camel project, um, I'm pretty sure you'll find that useful. For, so for when you're nurturing, so once you're done with the coding part where Rachel has been talking about getting that camel re ready, right? So you want to have a place to actually write it. And before you write it, you want to start with initializing, right? So you want to start... Where, so how do you start writing a camel project? A lot of people like, um, because camel comes in different format, right? Like there's like camel quarkus, camel spring boot, camel K, all these kind of different type of things. And one thing you probably want to know is other than camel K or camlet, those easy um, uh, cam Kubernetes friend friendly framework where the operator does a lot of things for you. Um, the other ones you want to have the project well configured uh, with all the libraries that's needed in order to get it running. So how do I prepare those kind of um, like uh, more bigger project structure, right? So there's many different ways you can do it. Um, the first one is you can go to Quarkus. I think it was the older, we were using that a lot because before uh, the next project, Chameleon, that started. I don't think we have anything, we, we have any options. So in order to start a Camel Quarkus, we can actually start from Camel Quarkus. But for me, I would recommend it to you to go to a Chameleon because this, this website is super cool where you can go off and then decide what Camel components that you need. And it is going to generate a uh, initialized camel project for you so you don't have to start from scratch or look up on the internet and finding what the component name is if you needed to use that so that's like been super useful for me another super useful uh, another very useful uh, project initializer for me is the camel extension project that is uh that was built for um uh Visual Code Studio, right? So for Visual Code Studio, um, I like what I like to do is I will always like to um, start by creating a new Apache Camel, and there's a bunch of helpers that can help me um, doing all this generating a um, a base a basic Camel project for me. So I can start from there. So you don't even have to leave uh, your IDE, right? So this is one of the things you can do with uh, when you're actually starting to. You know, starting your camel project. So this is something that I really like. 
And like I said, once you get your project ready, you want to start um, coding. So Visual Code Studio is probably the go-to ones right now or the most hippest one. I know a lot of people still code in uh, Eclipse or other IDEs. Um, I was using uh, Eclipse before, but now I switched to Visual Code Studio and I feel like that's easier. And um, so I kind of like, so this is like my favorite Visual Code Studio uh, where because it has a lot more plugins where I'm going to show you. So once you started your project, you're starting to define where your camera is com coming from and going to, and then you're going to start um, doing some kind of data transformation, right? So what is data transformation? So you're transforming a data from one point to another kind of uh, data structure. And this is like day-to-day -day chore for you to do, right? As an integration developer, because you constantly need to map one variable to another variable. Wouldn't that be easier if we can just drag and drop it, right? So LS map is the um, open source project that I would use if I ever have to do um, mapping between two different objects, right? So this is the tool. So there's two ways you can run this tool. Um, you can go to their website and then download their um, their installation file. They will, they will start up a local, a local server for you so you can use it there. Or you can always go to our favorite Visual Code Studio and then turn on the Atlas map here, install the extension here. Therefore, you will be able to do the drag and drop um, from from this extension. And you can actually, so to, to use that is pretty simple. You can import, so there's source and there's target, right? So this is where the data is coming from and this is where the data is going to. So therefore you can import as a Java class or a jar file or JSON file if it's if, if you're receiving a JSON or an output could be anything as well, right? A Java file, XML file. So once you import that, this the LS map is gonna analyze the data structures and then present you with this view of what variable it has. And then you can start doing the drag and drop to map between um, the two different sites, right? So that's a very useful tool that I think you can use for data transformation. So the output, so once you're done with the mapping, it's not done yet, right? Like, how do I get that into my camel project? That's that's the part where people don't understand, right? A lot of them. They say, I've done the drag job. What do I do? Well, what you do is you export what you have just configured. You export that as an ADM file and then place that ADM file into your, um, pro into your camel project. And inside your camel route, um, right after you receive your, um, your, your the blob or the data, you can then inject that um, particular uh, mapping into one of the routes, and it is going to then in here doing the um, doing the transformation for you. So, for instance, I'm getting a object here. I'm splitting down into smaller bits and pieces, and then I'm doing um, I'm doing the matching and then the mapping between the two variables, turning a JSON into another smaller piece of JSON, and then sending that into Kafka. So it's uh so for for instance, if you take a look, take a look at this example, it has a very big left hand side where it's very coming from ServiceNow, which has a very complex data format, which a lot of things we want to filter out. There's a lot of irrelevant um, information. So this is how I can do that with ease without doing a lot of um, handwritten coding. Another one I see uh, another uh, another really really good. Um, toolings that I see that can help me is when I create a RESTful APIs. So for RESTful APIs, everybody know there's a there's open API standard where everybody uses nowadays. If you're not, um, do go and check uh, the internet because it's what people are using right now for the standardization, right? So here, this um, this tooling of Curio helps me uh, helps me with how to set up the um, the APIs, right? I have a bunch of API that already set up here. For instance, I have a flight data center here where it had, it's, it's, it allows me to book or checking the status of my flight. And therefore I can use this tool to actually add another path, right? To do another say query of flight or whatever that is. And then I can use that to say, hey, if I'm doing using a get information, this is what I want to return as a 200, if it's okay, so if it's a 200 response. And here I can define what kind of information I want to return. So you're doing this all by hand. So I don't have to do a bunch of 
um, YAML or JSON um, formatting, right? I hate it. Um, so that's what I can do to, to make things easier. So once I get that definition configured, I can then export it. Um, they used to do um, camel project export, but I don't think they do it anymore. So just export that YAML file. And then there's two things you can do. If you're doing a more generic camel project with camel Quarkus, camel spring boot, you can use a plugin, a, a Maven plugin called camel open API RESTful DSL generator. It's a, um, a Maven plugin, just plug in there, run the command. It is going to then generate that camel DSL for you. You know, remember that um, camel DSL we're describing where each endpoint is, it's going to use that camel document. It's going to use that standard documentations and then generate that DSL for you. And then you can, you can then start coding on that camel DSL. Or if you're using camel K, like what Rachel was saying, that would be e even easier because what you can do is simply add, uh, run the, um, you can simply use this to use the, this tooling to actually call, define which camel route you want to call in in the in the peculiar toolings and then just have them all running together and boom, you have a RESTful API. You don't even have to do the RESTful configurations, right? So it's very, it's very simple. It's very easy. Um, that's what it is. And I think I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna I'll go a lot quicker, right? So, um, so I think like my last, I don't have to dive into details because because thanks for Christopher, um, he did a lot of things for me already. So like the testing scenarios, another thing you want to do in the Camel lifetime is you want to make sure everything's tested, right? So the, first, the uh, one type one type of testing is uh, white box testing, right? So you can use Camel Camel test support to do all this mocking, and normally I would do that with JUnit. So every single time when you build or when you run the application, it goes quickly to the testing, and because you are the developers, you write the testing code here. But then there's the other side. There's because integration is often that you have multiple components that you're trying to put together. And many of the times you just want to know that if the end result is, is correct. And you don't know, you don't want to know what's going on in your camel route. And that's called black box testing. So normally I would have the testing engineers do all the black box testing for me. So they would have a um they would have a accepted behavior. So they will expect this uh, camel to do this kind of behavior by putting this input. So that's the two things they would create. And um, I really want to mention about uh, Yikes here because I think what I like about this in this um, this particular testing tooling is that it's they're not only defining the, the expected behavior, but you're using the Yikes operator to create a isolated container which is only running the testing for you to test a camel application. For instance, if you're running camel K, like what Rachel was saying, running it on, on your Kubernetes environment, you already have a container that's there. So how do I test this container? Should I just write test code in this container? It doesn't make sense. So it makes a lot, a lot more sense to actually do an independent testing, black box testing to run a, a container next to your container and to test if the results came back as expected. So what you need to do is to write a feature file defining what the expected behavior is and the in input of the testing use case, and then send it to the Yikes operator. Then operator is gonna take care of initializing the container, uh, creating the testing, sending the testing to the camel applications, and then finish off the testing, which is uh, excellent, I think. Another tool, another one that I want to go over, how many time we have? All right, so is the platforms, right? So I think I've gone this for so much time. I, I don't know if you were sick of this already, but running camel is not easy, especially a fleet of camel, right? And, and especially with all these different types of camel, you've got camel caucus, camel spring boot, and camel can, all this kind of stuff. So it makes sense to have, have them all putting in the same platform. So I would always, um, suggest you to put your camel applications in a container and there's a lot of uh, benefits on the internet says why container is good, right? So I'm going to go over it. But I would say put that in a container so it's easier to manage because what you see is what you get. You're not going to get that, you know, this works in my computer problem. And then having all this container running on the platform can help you with, first of all, the resource management, right? So you have a place where you can put your secrets and these secrets can then be secured in that platform for your testing, production, you know, staging. 
And then we, when you have multiple cluster, that is going to the, be the problem because um, managing a single cluster is easy, right? You can have, always have your secrets somewhere and then having, party, uh, having people to deploy it for you, right? But, have, but managing it in a, in a multiple cluster management, that is going to be a lot more harder. And I'm, when I was looking into a, a, a survey that done by our company, we were surveying how many clusters do you think you would have um, in an enterprise? Most of them would have multiple cluster. So how do you handle all this multiple cluster? cluster of secrets and all this resource management, right? So having them in the same type of um, orchestration platform and then extracting the secrets and having them ex um, manage externally would be a lot better uh, as a proper secret uh, security management way, right? And then once you have that um, sorted, your resource sorted, let's think about running all this um, camel, like all the fleet of camel, right? So running all this fleet of camel, the first thing to think about is scaling. How do I scale it up? How do I scale it down? How do I uh, run it quickly? Right. So um, to run that on the Kubernetes platform makes makes you it makes it easy because you can define how you want to scale it up, scale it down, or even you, you can even introduce serverless to shut it down when you're not using it. And another thing that you can have as a as a bonus for on top of that managed orchestration Kubernetes cluster is uh, is the ability that camel now exports the metrics of the monitoring metrics, how many camels are running, how how long each route takes, and everything like that um, as, as a uh, micro-profile matrix. And you can get all this micro-profile matrix and then send that to a single entry point, which is Prometheus. Prometheus is pretty good at um, gathering all this information because now you have all these different containers. How do you gather all this and then display that in a single viewing points, right? So camel automatically export this information when you have the libraries, right? Uh, and configurations, right? It's gonna like automatically export it. So so all you need to do is just to gather all this um, metrics into, into it and then they, you will be able to see that. And to see that you can actually use the um, the dashboard to, to see it, right? And the last one is um, the CI CD part. Sorry, I'm running out late. Um, the CI CD part where you can have, um, I was using Tacton to actually help me building my camel use case. So I'm going to, I'm not, I'm going to go, I'm going to spare you with all the, you know, the, the theories. Let's go right into the demo. So I have a demo, right? I have a prescription API that was written in camel K, just like what Rachel did. Very simple APIs. So what I want to do is I have it all pushed up into um, a GitHub repository. So I want to push it and deploy it into, into um, OpenShift or on, on top of my Kubernetes cluster. And before I do the deployments, I want to make sure that it doesn't go wrong before it, it, um, it goes out and deploy. So I'm going to inject two testing, one test for expected um, successful case and the other one test for expected failure. So this must fail. Otherwise, you cannot go on, right? Those kind of thing. So this is what I did um, with ooh, uh, what did I do? with a demo. So in this pipeline, what I did was I started to fetch from Git, right? And then I'm gonna run a integration. I'm gonna go ahead and run it before before it's too late. So where's the run? Go ahead, action, start. So here, this is where I'm gonna, this is where my configuration is. I'm telling it to get it from my repository, from the master, and I'm running everything in my local environment. So for that, I need a place to actually hold on, on, on OpenShift to actually hold my GitHub repository, all this code, right? So I'm just writing it to a um, persistent volume claim, a persistent volume in, inside OpenShift. So that was kind of it. But now it's actually fetching. So if you take a look, it is now going to my uh, GitHub repository and then fetching everything into Kubernetes for me. And then it's going to do the camel run, right? So it now it deploys a testing environment or testing a prescription API on the internet. And then it's gonna go up and then run the two testing use case for me. So this one will always return success and this one will, will always return false. If something goes wrong with these two, I will not deploy. Right, so now it's gonna go up and then starting to create all this pod. So, so you now you can see now there's um, pods that are running. So, see this one is actually testing my use cases, right? And let's go back to the pipeline. Uh, 
pipeline runs. So it's still running, right? And then you can see now it's actually updating the, uh, the it's actually updating and letting me know how the testing goes, right? So it's saying, hey, I'm getting a successful testing. So it's it's done. The successful testing runs okay. And the failure one's running okay too, right? So now I'm gonna start and then deploy my applications into my um, environment. So that is pretty cool. So I got all my, um, and everything was running in my Kubernetes environment and I'm not using my local infrastructures or anything like that. Everything's done up here and everything's standardized. And in case I, I, did, I deliberately did a fail run, right? So this is what a fail run lo looks like. If something is wrong with the testing case, it will not go to the deployment, right? So that's how a proper uh, pipeline, and this is how you would release your camel into the wild and let them to start working. And um, I guess I am, my time's up. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. And uh, it's all for me. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. So that was a whirlwind tour of all the tooling around uh, Camel. And uh, thank you, Rachel, also for the uh, great demos before. Do we have any questions? I don't see any in the chat or in the Q&A panel. And we are running a bit out of time. So Thanks, Christina. Thanks, Rachel.